arch your back. Arch your back. Relax. Relax. Be comfortable. Get closer. Get closer. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to thank you for coming out. I know this week has been kind of crazy with lectures, so I'm really happy to see all of you here. Um, I'm really excited to present Ernest Truly to you, a visiting artist who came all the way from Estonia to be with us. And I had the extreme privilege to meet him this summer while I was doing a project in Tallinn. And I found his work and his way of working both, both as a individual artist and also as a collaborator to be extremely interesting and inspiring. So I'm really happy that I was able to bring him here um, to present to you guys. So, okay, so um, Ernest received his MA in art education from Portland State University, his MFA from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Massachusetts, and is currently a PhD candidate at Aalto University in Helsinki, Finland. He's lectured at numerous universities, currently teaches new media art and cross-media storytelling at the Baltic and Media School and Estonian Academy of Arts, and has participated in many group shows um, throughout the States and in Europe. Let's see. Uh, he's the former director of the residency program at Culture Factory Palmer in Tallinn, Estonia, and is the founding member of Error a collective of artists, designers, makers, and hackers based in the Nordic Baltic region who create interactive art installations as social meeting points. Um, and they use repurposed space and materials to do so. His research explores the connection between performance of identity and art production, uh, working across media to use art, science, and technology to bring us closer together. So without further ado, Ernest Truly. Okay, <clears throat> thank you and thanks everybody for coming. Uh, at the beginning, when I do artist talks, um, I make an image of the artist talk and there are a lot of people here, uh, but it won't look like it in the picture. So I want to invite you to like, if you would indulge me, like if you sat closer, like if you came more up front and like closer in the center, and then if we took a photo, it'll look like the whole room is filled. We'll get like an infinite perspective of people. So, and then you have the camera, so maybe you're in back there. Yeah, so you come closer. Closer. Comfortable. Closer. Come on in, be closer. Sit up straight. Okay, but 
Wait, I need to. Well, how does it look? Like, uh, But I, do you, do you know what I mean? Where it's like uh, it's it's people to the outside of the frame. And wait. I look too small in relation to the audience. So if you use telephoto, but you stand at a distance and you have a flattened plane, you might be able to pick it up. <laughs> this isn't irrelevant, but I think you'd like to. All right. And, uh, okay. But if you could just look towards me like um, you're, you're interested in what I'm saying, <laughs> then it's just from the back of your head, your faces could look disengaged. Okay. okay, what I mean is go like way to the back of the room, use telephoto, come in, and that should like flatten the, the planes. Does it? I hope so. All right. Uh, the first question, I, you know, like uh, part of why I do this is that uh, there's a lot of reasons why I do this, which I'm going to explain. But first, let's get the documentation. Oh, yeah, right. Don't you see? And uh, <laughs> all right, so there, I'm going to back up. I'm going to do this like an artist talk. I'm going to tell you something about my work and where I came from and um, um, <clears throat> how I got to this point and uh, whatnot. And uh, I want to be as, uh, what I want to say, like um, demystify as much as possible, like what... Uh, uh, at least my career has looked like and how it's been able to happen in those ways. But there came a point recently where, where uh, documentation became much more important than whatever it was was really happening. Like uh, the documentation of an exhibition, performance art documentation, uh, I cared more that I got the image than about the actual live performance at this point, this kind of turning point or crisis or something. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to start like when I moved to Europe in around uh, in 2008. And I had gone through this crisis because uh, I had moved and uh, I had went to, to get this MFA. I was already like 38 years old or something when I started. And um, I moved from a house that I lived like 15 years in Portland, Oregon. And like, well, anyway, I had all this stuff because uh, I came to art because of a love of materials and a love of making things. And 
if you live in the same place for 15 years, you accumulate a lot of stuff that you make and tools and materials. And uh, But I had to get mobile and I had to sell or give away or store or destroy all these objects, you know. It was like those were the options. And um, it was a traumatic experience. And... Um, and it was also like, shoot, I've, I've sat through some critiques here already and like, um, ah, I just feel this empathy, like uh, we, come, we, we come to the art world because of this love of, of, of materials, of making, of creating. And then like um, maybe in contemporary art, we find a place where like making is like irrelevant, you know, and um, and having to come to terms with those things. So, uh, I'd like to ask uh, what, um, what you'd like me to talk about, because um, my practice is pretty broad, and um, I'm going to start a little bit in the present, uh, working with a collective of artists uh, who are based in, like, say, Nordic Baltic countries, uh, Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, and then neighboring Sweden, and um, and Finland, and. Uh, Okay, so what I want to say about this is um, many of the people in the collective, we have uh, art training, but uh, we do not do the work necessarily in an art context. And um, most of our work appears more in kind of um, DIY formats and like maker fairs and um, more, say, regional kinds of art fairs. We do like, um, we did like an Echo Village project and environmental type projects. And um, I have found a lot of gratification working in collective. Art can be a really lonely business and I look for opportunities where we can work together. This is a, um, a mobile sauna stove. So we had a commission basically from a media arts organization in Helsinki called Pixelake. And um, they wanted us to make a sauna stove and bring it over from Tallinn to Finland by ferry. And so um, we didn't have a car. So we built it from this um, shopping trolley so that the stove is below and uh, the stones above, the chimney runs through this body here. And uh, we rolled it onto the ferry. And uh, everybody recognizes what it is in the northern region by the granite rocks and whatnot, although there weren't rocks in there, actually. We had our luggage. We collected the rocks there. And then um, we used it in a temporary sauna in a festival, and then it's been used since. But so we're working from recycled materials, and we're interested in creating social environments with the work. And in Northern Europe, sauna is a big part of that. OK, I'm going to take us to this. Um, to this project that um, kind of started when I was, um, when I first moved to Europe. And um, I was teaching a course on performance art documentation at the Estonian Academy of Arts. And I was having this um, crisis about stuff and making stuff and um, storing stuff and stuff being irrelevant and, um, so I started to work in like digital format, I think is, you know, and in, in the process for me, it's like um, I try and react to an impulse and, and then like later reflect on its meanings. 
So like um, really not to have too much inner criticism when I begin a project uh, to as long as possible kind of stay in a playful state, not worry about whether it's been done or the historical or theoretical background, like to shut those voices off and to really like just react to an impulse to make something. Um, Okay, and Andrew Hicks, who's over here uh, sitting back there, give a wave, Andrew, so they know who you are. And like, um, <laughs> Andrew's a, a, a media artist and uh, was teaching at uh, Columbia in Chicago at the time in New Media Art, and he was telling me about this project they were doing, doing like fake profiles uh, on Facebook. And so I, um, appropriated that project with the students I was working with at the Art Academy, and we all made these fake profiles. And uh, through some developments, I always mention these names, actually, because of the importance of the collaboration. And uh, Teresa Novotny was also involved in this class, who I just saw uh, at another festival, and, um, and then it became like the people in this project. Uh, okay, so. Let me show you two. And I, I don't like to do um, uh, I don't like to do PowerPoint displays. I, I kind of like to the riskiness of showing from the internet. You know, like art should be risky. And and then also like with this stuff, um, I was really thinking about um, authenticity in digital space. Like really frustrated, you guys all have to read like Walter Benjamin, right, and the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, right? And about like, um, just personally how frustrating it is with documentation, like you have this event and then you have a picture and then you put the picture on the internet and it's like so detached from the actual thing that you wanna talk about at this point that like, um, it is frustrating. It's like definitely something different and it's probably something less. So I was interested in producing work that was uh, created in digital space so that the work itself was the original. So if, I, if the performance itself was formed in Facebook, then what you see is not something less than something happened, than what happened, but it is the thing. It's like, the original. So um, I was friending people I didn't know and moving through their social networks. I was appropriating their images, uh, making a performance for the camera, and then using digital imaging to put the character into their photos. Do you get it? So family photo and I perform this for the camera. I'm working with a photographer and then using Photoshop bring them together into a remix. And this is the persona that, um, that I came up with through this course. And part of the persona, like we went out as a group and, and kind of had some costumes and we're taking pictures of each other. And uh, most of the pictures, I just looked like me in a hat, you know. And then this um, one photographer, Lea Girardin, uh, took this photo and I looked at it and like, yes, like I know who this is, okay. And um, this kind of work for me, I explained it's not like acting, I'm not, uh, it is uh, what I consider Tuk is this is a part of me that I do not perform like daily. I see myself as like fractured and um, that uh, sometimes people think I can act and they invite me to be in their indie movies or theatrical productions and I'm really a terrible actor but um, when I do this kind of work, it's a different process, and uh, so it's, it's an inward process. I find this part of me that I, I can perform, and it's real, and it comes to life. And um, this is a thing that I've started to work with students uh, also, like uh, tapping into these fractured selves 
as a way to um, tap into different kinds of problem solving approaches, different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when I talk about it, it sounds serious, and then when you see the work, you know, uh, oh, the thing I want to say about uh, this last picture, why I hung on it, is um, what I also liked about Facebook at the time was this opportunity for feedback. And um, so this guy knows that I wasn't sitting there next to him. It's his picture, right? Uh, but to get him to play along uh, in this suspended disbelief, I wanted to engage people on this level, like, go, like going to a play, uh, but that you can interact. And um, here he starts, like, uh, I, I gave it a title about how um, we're in Chicago. And he says, uh, this is when we were in Michigan. Maybe if you hadn't been passed out in the car for six hours, you would have remembered that. So like he's constructing the narrative and like we're being creative together and that's like my thing. Like that's what really um, uh, brings me to the art experience uh, when we're creative together. And um, so I can talk about this um, what can seem like really broad practice, but it is uh, unified by this. My statement is, is basically one sentence, which is about using art, science, and technology to bring us closer to each other. And so here I'm exploring these relationships in virtual space, like, you know, we were never physically together, but what does it mean to construct this kind of image and have this kind of like weird virtual date or, um, and that the experience isn't real, but the experience of being tagged in Facebook and opening up this picture and maybe laughing or maybe being shocked. He just kind of fits with these guys. And I think he has a good comment, which is uh, she sees you and I don't. Uh, and the writing there, uh, Tuke has this um, particular style of writing, so trying to give like voice to this persona. So he uses this kind of, um, what is it called when the word is spelled like it sounds? Phonetic. Yeah, like a kind of phonetic spelling kind of inspired by Estonian spelling and a dear friend who is dyslexic, how he spells. This, this one, I really like the comment also. He says, um, and through this project, I was like spending a lot of time looking through people's albums, trying to, to understand them, and like trying to connect with them through the photo that I was making, you know? And, um, and so this guy was using some different kinds of photo editing applications where he could like put photos into billboards or make it a, uh, like a decal on the hood of a car or something like that. And so he says, haha, man, you're amazing, LOL. Hey, weren't you scared? And I think like the amazing part is like he's uh, talking to the artist and the digital imaging and then the like, weren't you scared? Now he's talking to the character, you know, like this, uh, this creative play, constructing narratives together. And if people tried to engage him in too much talk, he it would usually end with him trying, he would ask for, for money, uh, like 20 crown or something, which is like $2. <clears throat> um, it, it has happened since doing this project. Uh, I did this project for about three and a half years, publishing at least one image a day. It was uh, quite intensive. Um, I learned quite a bit uh, in the process, and I, I also have to say that I 
felt some kind of relationship with the people in this project, though I had never met them really. I had only met them through this virtual thing, which was like mediated by, but sometimes I felt like, um, like that this was more me on Facebook than the, my real so-called Facebook profile. Like that you would know more about me, like my humor and that I, express myself through art and images and this kind of stuff like uh, than you would if I just had this. And, and Tuke was posting updates that were also like, um, I'm a thief, I'm a liar, I'm a junkie might be his update. Uh, this woman explains that she had to untag herself because the photo would scare her mom and um, I was always like watching for those kinds of feedbacks. Like I didn't want to get reported and like for Facebook to take this whole site down, you know, because it breaks the terms of agreement. And now it's really hard to make a fake profile on Facebook. I've tried to do it with students, but now we do, we use WordPress blogs. So you can see Tuke has this very limited repertoire. Uh, he's drinking or vomiting or passed out pretty much. So I wasn't really interested in building a huge audience for this project. These kinds of friends took time. And uh, I was more interested in, say, a small community that was, was into it. Here's two between the dumpsters over there. So I have met people that I know through this project since then in real life, and they didn't know it was me, but I knew it was them, and it was really strange. And one guy, I was like, it's me, and like, you know, and I did the lark. It's Took, and it was really, I don't know, it was like seeing an old friend or something. These are some like Slovenian fashion designers. So um, this project, like um, there were a lot of nice opportunities from this project, some real exhibitions, uh, traveling to Ljubljana in Slovenia and uh, in Finland and Helsinki and in Imatra. Uh, but the more I talked about this project in the real world, uh, I lost enthusiasm for it. And the more real world <clears throat> stuff like this, lecturing about it, kind of, um, I began to disengage with the project. But it was rigorous, like um, if I was gonna travel, I would prepare, you know, whatever, so many days of images ahead of time so I could still publish every day. I can get a little dogmatic and obsessive. All right, so, um, so this is like one experience, if we call this a, um, uh, an experience that you've been tagged, and then like giving people other experiences. So there were albums, like you could be in one of Took's dreams, or you might appear in uh, one of his exhibitions. And I'll show you... Uh, this is um, infiltrating performance artists, uh, a network of like international performance artists. Okay, and then you uh, two could also come in this um, symbolic form, which uh, another user. Uh, a participant, I should say, in the project uh, constructed this. Um, it's the Venus of Willendorf with a stocking cap and headphones. And uh, so I took the image and then would do these visits uh, with this kind of symbolic toque.
And yes, so there's albums where you can get a, the beer, the diesel beer, or a Took t-shirt, or um, where you're with the Venus of Willendorf version. Is this, um, I don't know, do you have any questions? Is this stuff interesting? I can... Well, um, you know, I was, I think I was kind of treating Facebook like public space, or at least, let's say, like investigating uh, the idea of like, it's a kind of graffiti or appropriation. And if you post your photos and like, and um, it is not a free space, like the terms of agreement is basically that your account could be shut down for any reason with no recourse. And then when you start seeing it as a, a place to store, you know, this amount of information, uh, I do have, um, like, you know, whatever backups and screenshots and a lot of documentation of this, but uh, I really like that it lives and lingers in Facebook. So... Uh, it was not about like Facebook activism, like how to get a site shut down. Like I, I think that sounds pretty easy project, <laughs> like just to get a site shut down, like, cause they're so strict. You just need a couple people to report what you're doing and they'll shut you down. I'm really amazed that he's still is lingering here. Does that answer your question? I was messing around a lot with these albums and then like realized if you flip through them fast enough, you can make animations. I think. This one's also an animation. The dreams were also animated. You need fast internet for the Facebook animation. Can you see them? Oh, okay, you get the idea. Did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I think with the Facebook thing, I was trying to, like, get away with something. Yeah. Uh, this is a fake exhibition in Ljubljana. Uh, I did have a real exhibition there, but I liked this space better. So I uh, mounted the sign for it digitally and... Uh, put my text in there and um, digitally put my works into the gallery. And um, here in uh, Slovenian is a really nice conversation about um, whether it's appropriate uh, for using these images. Um, and about this kind of uh, remix culture and appropriation. 
So, uh, and then people went to the museum to see the exhibition, like they believed these images. Uh, many more people complained to the museum that this wasn't an appropriate exhibition for it. And um, I have, and, and I'm interested in the fake, you know, or in this like simulacra, or like I don't care. And I always think like, uh, cause I was morally raised by television, like that I, I just am not bothered by what's true or not. And if you tell me something, I don't even care if it's true. I'm just trying to think like, why are you telling me this? Like, what is it you want me to know by telling me this thing? So the whole faith thing, I'm not really bothered by. And I just like led a course where we were doing a culture jamming project where we made like a fake real estate company and sometimes the students were like bothered by the ethics of it. And I was really surprised. I was like, well, if you like painted a bowl of fruit and it was like, you know, Trump Loy and really good. And like someone thought it was like, I mean, how is this different? Like that's our business. We do representations. It's not like, uh, so when we do it on the web and we start like using these same, uh, uh, techniques to tell stories as if they were true, like, yeah, for me, there's no ethical conflict. Because I don't think the things that are really posted on there that are supposed to be true are true. Do you? Do you care what's true? Come on, let's talk. We don't really care. Okay, so, <laughs> it's true. All right, uh, so, okay, so some of you may be interested in artist residency and uh, we can talk, uh, if you are, more about that. I, I have sort of a, like a network of residencies in this Nordic Baltic area that I've described. And I was organizing residency for a culture center for uh, many years and um, you know, it's like one way that young artists kind of support their careers. Like, uh, I think the people I know in Europe, it's like somewhere between like residencies and projects and then some kind of job and then you could like uh, make ends meet. So uh, this mobility thing uh, has been really important to me in this like precarious artist's life. Uh, I was a art teacher in high school in Portland, Oregon. And um, so uh, like, and then when I went to Europe, I learned this term precarious to describe my new lifestyle where it was like, um, I, I could not be guaranteed what my income was or like where the next thing was happening, but, uh, and then like always on the job. So if I'm not doing a project, I'm applying for projects. If I'm not in a residency, I'm applying to residencies and whatnot. And this was a thematic and financed uh, residency in Nida Art Colony in Lithuania. And they have these ultra modernist, like lofted studios uh, with all this IKEA furnishings. And I started, um, basically I was determined to have like a fake residency. So I was really there, but I was in the computer lab every day. And um, I was constructing these images as if I was making these large prints and putting them on the studio wall. And um, Uh, as if I was making sculpture and, and whatnot in my studio and promotional material. And so I was working with these glitch images in digital form, but uh, was not printing and uh, had become like, okay, um, w one thing that has drawn me to art is that you could like make your weakness a strength. 
and uh, I can have like a really adolescent and anti-authoritarian attitude, which I think is like a weakness because I'm like almost 50 years old and chill out. But in art, you know, like maybe it's a strength. Like, uh, and so I was like, I'm not making anybody else's capital. You know, fuck it. I'm not going to like produce what they want me to produce in this residency. I'm going to produce nothing, you know. And, uh, but I was doing like 12, 15 hours a day, like digital imaging and running to my studio to do these like performance for the cameras and then doing this digital imaging stuff. Uh, this was like a vanity posting about like, yay, I'm printing my works for the exhibition, you know? And so it's like an appropriated image of a printer and this is my image that I've put on there. And then so this, which is the poster, it, the context is like, well, there is a nude beach in Nita, but I thought I should make an image that... Um, that looks like I'm having a social life and not sitting in front of the computer all day, you know? So this kind of mimicking like what is a good time. So I was also telling the story that I was growing cannabis in my studio as sustainable practice. Like the, the residency provides uh, electricity and I was using it like to the best resource, but it wasn't true. My studio was empty, I was growing nothing, it was quite clean. But it was weird because people who watched me make the images I was working in the lab were still like asking me like, oh, we want to go to your exhibition or when will your plants be ready? Like uh, really believing the image uh, more than what they were actually seeing. So this is like, it's like a fake poster. Like this is a wall they would know and I put up a white sheet of paper and then I digitally like put the poster on it because I wasn't gonna spend any money. Like I wasn't even gonna give them like that 15 cents to print the actual poster. So I did it all in Photoshop. And, uh, and then left the blank piece of paper and they were still like, oh, we're gonna go to Vilnius and see your show. Uh, installation of the works. The exhibition. So it's like appropriate. It's a real space, the Contemporary Art Center in Lithuania. It's like their Museum of Contemporary Art. It's a really beautiful museum and uh, like a social center of the city. So I found like a website, and this is like the former minister of culture, and these are the curators of the museum. And I'm holding this uh, bowl of traditional this kind of pink cold soup that's famous in Lithuania and at the reception and then my final harvest so and that was the studio and it, the studios really remind me of the sculpture tall space I've been telling people who know Nita it's like a cross between Nita and the witch and wizard school and Harry Potter movies. Okay. How are we doing? Any questions? I don't understand. Like, cause, okay, there's people who are like, oh, dude, I want to see your exhibition, and then they go on the display. It's like it's like an inferno, and they're like, oh, man. And so, like, how do you feel about that? Um, in that particular situation, I don't think they'd be disappointed. Like, there's something good at that museum. No, I, yeah.
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I know uh, it's and it's it's gray. There's not a strict boundary because um, I think an important part of storytelling and of the job is like to inhabit your fiction, you know. And I also don't think that that is necessarily like it's not the same as being deceptive or. So um, sometimes through these projects, like I talk about Took, for instance, the Facebook guy, third person, you know and what Took did and what Took posted. And, you know, for me, that is a reveal. I'm like, it's not. And then like in this residency, I was doing all the work in the, the media lab, which is like a fishbowl. So wherever you go, it's this glass room and like anybody could look over my shoulder and see what I was doing. So I think at that time I was speaking about things uh, like I was inhabiting that fiction, but at the same time I was revealing. And then I also feel like this kind of glitch thing that was running through is a kind of reveal and like leaving hints. And it's not about tricking. That's not what interests me. It's more like engaging you in some kind of play. Like uh, I'm not gratified by tricking someone. Yeah, it shouldn't matter. Like, um, I, I think like with art, um, like the secret shouldn't matter. It should still work somehow. Like that, there's nothing I have to hide really, that you couldn't engage with it also. But I do like uh, if the viewer has like an aha moment, you know, and to let that happen, you know. So I don't feel the need to like say, this is fake because I think every time you enter the screen, you already know it's, it's not real at least, right? Like of course, it's, it's like everything is kind of fake on this level. Uh, yes? What you're talking about and what you don't want to feel the effect of self. Uh, myself, I see as, um, yeah, uh, all authentic, but like fractured, like, you know, more multifaceted than deep. Is that what you mean? Uh, <laughs> And like this kind of theoretical level, I don't know if this is important, maybe it is. It's like, um, I, I think we all have to play certain roles based on our, uh, these labels that we carry, our, um, our class, our gender, our nationality, our race, our ethnicity, all these kinds of things uh, as to, and, and how we're expected to perform these things on a daily basis and that it, the, there are or we perceive negative consequences for like not playing our parts, you know? And uh, so those parts that we're not supposed to play are like sometimes our most creative, 
parts, right? Because that's like what's sort of most dangerous to whatever you want to call it, this like advanced capitalism or spectacular society or whatever it is that we're all kind of consuming and contributing to. So um, that when you, yeah, so those are our creative selves uh, that often get really quieted and uh, like that through art, there can be this kind of safe and sanctioned territory to tap into those fractured portions of self. And it's really useful with uh, teenagers. Like, um, I, I won't have time to show you all these projects, but um, my MA in education, the thesis work was based on a unit of study with, uh, based on Cindy Sherman's work where students were performing identity for the camera and um, constructing these identities. And it's really cathartic. It's like, if you can remember being a teenager where these like structures and identities are really like forced on you, you know, these labels of who you are and those categorizations become even more important as you're like a teen moving into adult years. And when they have like opportunities to play with, construct, investigate, um, uh, identity, their own identity. It's amazing what happens. So that's like my research for this upcoming doctoral work. Uh, I'll show you this. I'm going to just finish up in uh, this little bit. We're going to be out by five. But uh, I, I want to share this one project because uh, this is a workshop we did in Culture Factory Polymer. And uh, it is a disused toy factory uh, uh, producing these kind of like creepy toys uh, in the Soviet times and um, now uh, at, at this time occupied by artists and uh, other people in this kind of uh, community. So uh, in this workshop it's similar to the workshop that I propose to do tonight and um, it, it comes from this uh, practice that I was seeing. First, when I went to Estonia, uh, part of what I was interested in was collective practice, that artists were working together. And I was really like excited by that. Like, oh, it's, it's a different mode of production. Like, coming from an MFA program where people are so like, one studio doesn't really relate to the next. Like, there isn't an apparent dialogue. It's very individualistic. And like, it was really hard to get people to work together, I found, uh, in my MFA program. Although we did. We had an awesome collective called Circle of Life. But, um, so I went to Estonia, like, it's a different mode of production, like, it, this is like something new, you know, this is exciting, like, how do artists work in collective? And um, they were, they, they have a lot of codes and rituals and a manifesto and whatnot, this collective non grata, which is eventually what led me to uh, my job and my time in Estonia. But... Um, so we did this workshop uh, in Polymer. What you're seeing here, it's a, an architectural model of a, um, of a gallery with artworks and performance digitally installed into it. Uh, so the gallery is real somewhere, but we built a model of it and uh, photographed it. But this is how we were really living. Uh, in this like rough factory space and we had this weird frozen wood that we were trying to like chop and melt and warm in a cycle to keep ourselves warm in this space. And we were, um, so we committed ourselves to this space. First we, we started, we went to this architectural, uh, this museum of architecture and looked at models. It was, it was one of the themes of the workshop because I was observing these performance actions in these uh, where, where the artists would isolate themselves in a gallery or studio for 72 hours. And there would be like the shift in consciousness and behavior and the way people were acting over this time. And I was really interested in what was happening, but then I, I, with this workshop, it was like uh, an experiment. Like, could you use that process? Could you use that shift in consciousness towards a focused project. Like you have an end goal in mind and then you all get freaky together by spending, you know, whatever, 72 hours isolated and like, but you're just focused on this problem. And would it work, you know? Uh, because in these other actions, it was more like about 
this regression that could happen. You can support each other going into this like infantile state and start smearing the walls and breaking things. And uh, I was I was interested in that experience and that that could happen, but I like one, wanted to see if it could be sublimated, you know. And all of you must understand like the zone, right, where you engage in this work and like 15 hours pass and like whew, you didn't eat, you didn't. You were like, Shh, you know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, so the zone. So uh, how do you stimulate the zone? Sometimes it just happens, right? And then others, sometimes there's strategies to get into it. So this, uh, this isolation is a strategy for putting yourself into this like state of shifted consciousness. And that it's connected to me to this fractured self, like to, to get in touch with this part of self that you're not performing, you're taking a break from, from this greater social realm into this like micro social realm. Uh, I'm sorry, so uh, this guy builds, he's an artist, um, great, makes great installation, I wish I could show his work, but he, he works with really minimal tools, like he builds architectural models with these four or five things. And that is a theme that ran through this factory, like working from recycled materials, this is also in, this, in our work environment, uh, working with minimal tools. So this was the real, this was the space we were eating in, sleeping in, uh, preparing our meals. I thought this was classic, young art student measuring the proportions of an egg. Uh, this was some um, analog photo stuff we were playing with. Uh, we were also doing these kind of uh, confessional videos uh, talking about the experience uh, at certain intervals. Uh, one of the artists from the collective came and led us each morning in like stretching and yoga. And so I was interested in like, okay, so the, there are these constraints, we're staying in the space, it's cold, it's dirty, uh, but like what, what do we need to stay healthy enough to be focused and work and like stay on this thing? And so there was like process observers, like uh, other artists I asked to drop by and make sure we weren't like just losing the, the plot. And uh, so stuff like this happens, you know, when you're have stayed up together for a couple days and you're playing around in an old factory, it can happen. And I think sometimes it's like the most important thing. Uh, I call it creative play. And like you're not really making art together, but you are exploring materials, you are having a good time. Uh, and often in these moments, like ideas emerge and uh, lead to, uh, to realizations of uh, projects having some porridge. Uh, video installation with this egg that was ultimately projected on an egg and... and all the junk that we had there um, in this space. Okay, so uh, do you have some questions? I, I haven't really talked about like most of the things I'd hoped I would, but. 